Hello fellow cyborgs and welcome to the much awaited comparison video between Tess of the D'Urbervilles and Ruth. So these are two Victorian novels written by two different authors whose main heroine is a quote unquote fallen woman, a woman who has had sex before marriage. I am going to give a relatively spoiler free review of these two novels and compare between the two. And then I will get into spoiler territory because I do want to talk about the endings of both of these. I'll let you know when that part comes, but for now let's get on with the less spoilery bits. So the first thing I wanted to contrast between Elizabeth Gaskell's Ruth and Thomas Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles is the mood and writing style of the two novels. Both of these works have a fairly lyrical writing style. However, I will say that Thomas Hardy's writing style for me is lyrical more often and to the point of obscurity at times, whereas the lyrical writing in this comes in fits and starts when Ruth is describing the nature around her, which is very important to her, and Elizabeth Gaskell's writing style is far more contemporary and more approachable for a modern reader. Ruth has an overall more hopeful tone, and that is a really important aspect to this story and the point that it's making. Thomas Hardy, as classic Thomas Hardy, this is a lot more dreadful and a lot more pessimistic. As far as the setups of the plot, with Tess of the D'Urbervilles, we meet Tess, who is from a very poor family. Her father is told that they are derived from the fancy D'Urbervilles. Her name is Derby Field. Tess's father asks her to go talk with the D'Urbervilles and hopefully get in their good graces. She meets Alec, a D'Urberville, who immediately takes a shine to her because she's a pretty lady and then won't leave her alone. Tess knows pretty much exactly what he's all about and she does as much as she can as a Victorian young woman to make his advances go away without offending him. However, Alec is very perseverant and also opportunistic and he eventually has his way with Tess, which results in her getting pregnant. This has a very rural setting. Tess ends up working on a farm. Tess eventually meets a man named Angel who falls desperately in love with her and the plot moves on from there. Tess's relationship and interactions with these two men, Alec and Angel, form a major part of the plot. In Ruth, Ruth is recently orphaned and working as a seamstress, working pretty much down to the bone. This is not a good environment. The person responsible for her doesn't really care about her and shipped her off to do this. Ruth, I believe, is just shy of 16 and I think Tess is as well, so their ages kind of match up. Ruth catches the eye of Mr. Bellingham at a fancy party. Ruth is there as last minute repair seamstress. He pursues pursues her and gets into her good graces. Eventually, on an innocent outing between the two of them, Ruth's boss notices them together and fires her on the spot. Mr. Bellingham offers her the coach and says that she can run away with him. She asks him to take her back to her hometown, but instead he takes her to Wales. There, she becomes his mistress without really knowing what's going on, since she was never warned about men and those sorts of issues that women in the Victorian era would come against. So since her mother died before that was even a conversation worth having. Mr. Bellingham forsakes her in Wales after a series of events, and Ruth is taken in by the Bensons. The plot of this novel is definitely not nearly as Ruth-centric as Tess is Tess-centric. This novel actually picked up once Mr. Bellingham had left the scene and the Bensons became more prominent characters. I really loved them, and especially their housemaid Sally. They really lift the tone of this book and make it so much more hopeful. For the Victorian period, they are incredibly understanding people. They do not see Ruth as a wicked woman, but as someone who has sinned and can now better herself. They also do not believe her unborn child to carry the sin of his mother and father. Mr. Benson is a dissenting clergyman, and he lives with his sister Faith. They are patronized by the Bradshaws. Mr. Bradshaw is a fairly wealthy mercantile patriarch to a family. We are in the head of one of his daughters, Jemima, for a good portion of this book as well. Ruth is definitely an ensemble cast and that is one of its strengths. Tess, on the other hand, is a lot more focused and within the minds of Tess and Angel. In fact, I think those are practically the only point of viewpoints within this novel. Though I think this is fairly common in Thomas Hardy, he seems to have a more claustrophobic point of view in a lot of his novels, at least in the ones that I've read. For me, that is kind of the downfall. Because I find Angel to be so incredibly irritating and Tess to be a really hopeless character, this 
just kind of wears me out. Whereas in Ruth, we have so many kind and giving characters. Sally is absolutely hilarious, which adds a lot of humor to this book that should be incredibly depressing. We have a lot of different characters with different subplots to keep track of and bounce between. It's not an overwhelming number of those, but I like how that lifts the overall tone of this work. Next, I want to talk about the heroines a little bit. So Ruth is definitely uh, too good to be true. This novel is very, very critical of how the Victorian society treated women like Ruth. This book posits how we can better treat these women who were having sex before marriage for whatever reason. And because of that pretty hard hitting and fairly radical viewpoint at the time, Ruth was written 40 or 50 years before Tess of the D'Urbervilles. Ruth has to be a otherwise unblemished and unblemishable character. Tess, on the other hand, is still considered a pure woman, especially by Thomas Hardy. That was a subtitle for this work when it was originally published. She definitely has more of a mind of her own and a lot more gumption. Tess for me feels like she has a lot more agency. She does make actions and make decisions that are really empowering for a woman, especially at the end of the 1800s. But it's just that society keeps stepping on her and pushing her back down. So I definitely find Tess the more compelling of the two heroines. It's just so unfortunate that her book is just so incredibly bleak. The messages these two works are sending to their Victorian audience is pretty much the same. In my opinion, Thomas Hardy is a little bit more in your face about it and very interested to throw the Victorian ideals and their hypocrisy in their face. I think Gaskell comes at this a little more subtly and a little bit more as a guide to how we can make better choices as a society rather than just condemning what society has done to these women, even though she does do that too. To me, it feels like Thomas Hardy pointing his finger and shouting at how gross it is how women are treated in the Victorian period and Elizabeth Gaskell talking politely and yet persuasively about maybe we should change our opinions and this is why let's be good Christians. So now I am going to talk about the endings. If you don't want to be spoiled on these two stories, then don't listen. But I don't think knowing the ending is going to ruin the experience really. And I also don't think that if you know a thing or two about the fallen woman story in Victorian literature that you'll be at all surprised by the endings. So for those of you still here, you know the endings in Tess and in Ruth. Tess and Ruth die. This was an ending I definitely saw coming more in Tess of the D'Urbervilles. This is incredibly bleak and incredibly soul crushing the entire time. I've also heard, I believe on a Stuff You Missed in History Class podcast, that the inspiration for Tess came from Thomas Hardy as a boy seeing a public hanging of a murderess. And the image he had of this woman being hung was like a, an image inspiration for Tess. So she gets hung as a murderess at the end of this. Now, as incredibly depressing of a thing that is, it's also kind of awesome. The reason why Tess is hanged is that she ends up murdering Alec, who originally raped her at the beginning of the book and then later made her his mistress. And as ethically problematic as that is, it's also incredibly empowering. So even though Tess is being executed for her crime, at the end, she made this decision to do a thing to get vengeance for herself. I really like that even though Yet again, Tess is doing something, having agency and then being stepped on and really stopped. She still has that last moment of agency. In Ruth, Ruth dies because she ends up being a sick nurse for Mr. Bellingham, who raped her at the beginning by turning her into his mistress without really explaining what that was all about and kidnapped her in essence to Wales when she asked to go in a different direction. She catches the typhoid fever that he has and dies like a saint figure. This was incredibly frustrating to read in an otherwise hopeful and accepting book. This would have been a five-star read had that not happened. If Ruth died in a different way at the end of the book, if she had died from a typhus outbreak nursing other people, I probably wouldn't have been so shocked and disappointed. But because she dies, because she's nursing the one major asshole in her life, I was very confused and frustrated. Fortunately, the introduction to Ruth talks about this a little bit. It's not a really satisfying explanation, but I like that someone smarter than me pondered this 
just as hard. So I'm going to read you a section from that introduction. But to give you context, Tim Dolan, who wrote the introduction, had previously argued that the fallen woman story, it's the main trope of that story is that she dies at the end. So he's addressing why Gaskell felt she had to do that here. So why couldn't she, Gaskell, escape the conventional idea that Ruth, the heroic, dignified, expansive creature, is also a victim who must have her tragedy? Either the story of social reintegration she entertains, her having a life with the Bensons, is a bourgeois fantasy from which the novel must wake itself up pretty sharply, or the story of sacrificial redemption is deemed to be a tragic necessity somehow, a way of cleansing the whole community of its sin as Ruth has cleansed herself. But if that is the case, the objection that W.R. Gregg put to this ending in his review in 1853 must be put again. If Ruth is as pure, pious, and unselfish as she is, and if her lapse from chastity is as faultless as such a fault can be, why does Gaskell give in to the world's estimate in such matters, by assuming that the sin committed was of so deep a dye that only a life of atoning and enduring penitence could wipe it out? Moreover, as another of the novel's first reviewers briskly reminded Gaskell, in fact, a great many so-called fallen women did become successful wives and mothers. The problem was the novels must not show them doing so, or at least going on doing so. Mainstream fiction must reinforce the conventional fate of the fallen woman, lest the example of the exceptional heroine left unpunished should inadvertently lure vulnerable young female readers into further sin. When I first finished this, I did, my first thought was maybe Gaskell chickened out of writing a really radical ending to this really radical book. And it looks like Tim Dolan agrees with me, which is frustrating. And yet I have to remind myself that this was written in like 1850 something. And this book otherwise is incredibly radical and incredibly sympathetic to the fallen woman. So I guess if Gaskell has to kind of blow the ending for the sake that this book will actually be read by her contemporaries in the hopes that we can treat these women who've been treated poorly better, then I guess that's okay. But as far as endings go, I do think that Tess is far more satisfying than Ruth. Okay, welcome back from the spoilers. So to sum up, I think that Tess is probably the better book, but way less enjoyable in my opinion. I gave Tess only two stars upon reading it, whereas Ruth has some tonal inconsistencies at times, but is overall far more entertaining and hopeful, and I nearly loved it, if only the ending had been different. So which of these should you read? Tess is the far more famous of the two, and Ruth, I think, is one of the very much forgotten Gaskell novels. I think a lot of people just completely skip Ruth. But for me, I think that's a big mistake. There is a lot to love about Ruth. Ruth reminds me a lot of Wives and Daughters in the ensemble cast, the small village setting. It is just really good. Tess definitely has its merits, and if you get on with Thomas Hardy's writing style more than me, you could love this. A lot of people do. If you want to be depressed, <laughs> read Tess of the D'Urbervilles. If you want something that has large sections of hope and hopefulness and some sections that will make you giggle, then pick up Ruth. Both are worth your time, even if I didn't particularly enjoy Tess. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was worth the wait and editing Amanda makes it seem more cohesive than it seems right now. Let me know in the comments down below if you would read either of these, if you have read either of these, and if you think you might want to pick up both. Thank, thank, thank you for watching, and until next time, continue to be lovely.